Happy New Year and welcome to First United Methodist Church, Plano. I'm Judith Reedy, I'm associate pastor here, and we are so happy that you've joined us. This is Communion Sunday, so if you're at home in your worship places, we invite you to gather up your bread and juice for the communion we'll have, or you are invited to drive by anytime from 12.15 on today, about between 12.15 and 1, uh, and have drive-by communion where we will serve you regular or gluten-free. So once again, we're happy to have you. Stay tuned for the next two or three weeks. We'll be informing you of our new programming for the rest of the winter, and that will include a grief session, a six-session program for grief recovery beginning in March. Welcome. Happy New Year and Happy Epiphany. Well, almost Happy Epiphany. That is on Wednesday, January the 6th. But we have been celebrating this season beginning as early as November 29th, which was the first Sunday in Advent, and we carry it all the way to Epiphany. If we lived in Ethiopia and we were Orthodox Christians, we would do everything all at one time on January the 6th. Christmas, all of it, we would celebrate when Christ was revealed to the, all the nations on that one day. And if we were fortunate, we could take a trip over to beautiful Leila Bella. If we're Orthodox, Roma, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Catholics, then whether you live in the Ukraine or whether you live in the North Texas area and you're Ukrainian Catholic, you didn't start celebrating until the eve of Christmas, December 24th. But you celebrate all the way through Epiphany on through February the 7th when Jesus was taken to the temple by his parents. So what is Epiphany? Epiphany is the beginning of a very long story 
the story of the light of Christ leading us and guiding us in showing love to all of humanity. And it's the story we're going to read in today's scripture. It is, however, also the story of an evil king, Herod, who is so frightened of anything that threatens him that he will do anything he can to, to overcome that or even to kill it. It's the very opposite kind of power that Herod uses from the kind of power that God uses. Will you pray with me? Holy One, we give thanks for your revelation and for the love that you continue to use as power, your power. In Christ's name, amen. One of my grandsons turned five last year, went to school, and his parents noticed that as he would pass through the family room on the way to play or the way to study, he began to say things like, he'd look on the television, and he'd see a picture of a woman or a man, and he'd say, bad girl, bad guy. And then he'd keep walking, bad girl, bad guy. And at first they thought, what? And then finally they, they said, oh, we've been talking passionately about some things that we believe, and he's heard us, and without even hearing that, he just assumes that if you look like this, you're a bad girl. If you look like this, you're a bad guy. And they thought, okay, that's kind of funny. But after a while, they said, that's not funny. That's not funny. He's saying this without really thinking it through or understanding. So when he turned six and was still doing this, they said, hey, we need you to come in here and sit down. This is going to be a long story, but we need you to understand why mommy and daddy are talking passionately at times about people that you are calling a bad guy and a bad girl. And here's the deal. It's that when these, when these things are going on that hurt other people or that don't show love to all people, we get upset. But that doesn't mean, well, and so then they went on and on. And every time they'd stop, they'd say, you understand? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Finally, at the end, they said, do you understand? And he said, I think so, but that was a really long story. <laughs> so it's a really long story, the story that we're reading today of Epiphany. Let's look at that story. It begins the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the child was to be born. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Jerusalem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went. And look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chest and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. They went back to their own country by another way. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So guess what? There is a bad guy in today's story, a really, really bad guy. And that is King Herod, who is so threatened by anything that threatens his power that he is willing to do bad things, including killing. The Bible doesn't tell us this, but records tell us that King Herod, before Jesus was born, had already killed his second wife, Mary Omne I, and three of his sons. He was terrified of anyone taking his power. Now, that's the complete opposite of the way that God uses power. God uses love as power. The Gospels tell us, the letters of Matthew and letters of Paul tell us that God uses power as vulnerable, as life giving. God uses power for seeking and finding just like those magi did. They were seeking and finding the truth. And in this time of the pandemic, haven't we all heard those heroic stories of particularly the frontline workers who are seeking and finding ways to serve other people, putting other people in front of themselves? And I'll just lift up two right now, and you can add yours to that. And the two that I'm thinking of today, one is, is uh, a woman named Addie Fagan. She was the second of four sisters to pursue a medical career, and she was all about service. She constantly went on mission trips to Haiti. She constantly did mission at home, and she was an OBGYN uh, resident. And in, in July, she developed COVID. She was taken to the hospital, and on September 19th, Dr. Fagan died. Having served almost all of her 28 years, other people. And the second person I'm thinking about is a man, Gerardo Pacheco. He was a firefighter and a paramedic. And he worked all night long on his shifts, but he rushed home in time to be there first thing in the morning for all of his sons so that he could have a hot breakfast for them. And while he did that, he tuned up his stereo as loud as it would go, and he always played LL Cool J so that it would wake them up. But what they saw in their father, this firefighter and this paramedic, but also when he was home, he was mowing his neighbor's yards for free. He was checking on all his neighbors. He was constantly checking on the most elderly in the neighborhood. So even one of his sons had already become a paramedic, a firefighter, when his father, this past August, late, developed signs of COVID, insisted on driving himself alone to the hospital. He did not want any of his children to, to be possibly getting that from him. And in a few short days, he was gone as well at age 50. But he had spent his life seeking and finding ways to serve other people. God's power of love also shows up when, like the Magi, some people decide to take another way home. C.P. Ellis was white and poor and had never been invited to a thing in his life when the KKK invited him. Come join us. C.P. said, well, okay. And they found that he was so good at organizing, even though he was the lower class, and they were mostly middle class and some upper class, they used him to organize terror. And one day it occurred to him, I think they're using me. But he kept on, and a white person from the other side of the fence saw his powers, and integration was happening in the schools at that time. And they came over to CP, and they said, you've got great skills, and here's what we think It'll take somebody like you to pull us all together. You get them and organize us, and we'll integrate these schools. And he said, what would I have to do? He said, um, meet with a black woman. She's here on campus. She has lunch in there in the same cafeteria where you do at your job every day. He went, I could not meet with a black woman, much less eat with her. 
And so he didn't for a while. And one day, though, he came out of work at lunchtime, and she was sitting at her table by herself. And CP went over to Ann Atwater, sat down, and he said what they both already knew. You know what? When these schools get integrated, the ones who can afford it are going to take their children and put them in private schools or somewhere else. And the economic base of our schools, public schools, are going to collapse. It's going to collapse. And he started crying. And Ann Atwater, a pretty tough gal, leaned over and touched him tenderly. And that touched him. And he went over to the KKK meeting the next time, and he said, guys, I think we can do this. I honestly think we can. We can organize and we can all get together. They wouldn't have anything of it. In fact, before long, he was out of a job. He was unemployed. And he was unemployed for months until he finally got a job at Duke University. Because of his organizing skills, he rose up to be a top machinist. He was the only white person in that union. But all that time, he kept communicating with Ann Atwater back and forth back and forth. And as he communicated with her, they had a tie, a firm tie. He died, C.P. Ellis eventually died, and Ann Atwater came to his funeral. She got there really early. She went inside the church. She walked down to the very front pew. She sat down. And about that time, an usher pulled up beside her and in, in behind her kind of cleared his throat, said, <clears throat> this is a private service. She said, I know. He said, this is a family service. It was, she was irritated by then. She said, I know that. C.P. is my brother. You see, Ann Atwater and C.P. Ellis had both decided to take another way home. Showing God's love means giving second chances. All this time, up until now, if you've tuned in at all, you've seen us use Mark Miller's I Believe Even When. And I remember the first Sunday it played, and Robin had orchestrated this with all the choir singing together. And as we listened to it, everybody was spellbound. And we got to staff the next Tuesday, and we were complimenting Robin and the choir. And Matt said, I'd like to hear that every Sunday during Advent. And she said, well, won't people get tired of it? Take a listen to that refrain. I believe in the sun. So the person who wrote the song that we sang all during Advent, Mark Miller, is United Methodist through and through. He is a brother, a nephew, a son of United Methodist clergy. He's come to the North Texas Clergy uh, Conference here, and he has led us all throughout the worship time with his music, his composing. He's delightful. He always has this beatific smile. Last year in February... We went to general conference for one single purpose, and that was to vote on whether the United Methodist would now ordain LGBTQ and marry uh, same-sex couples. And it was rather tense, it was very serious, but there was hope on both sides, I'm sure, and it came time for the vote after the end of the whole conference. And the vote was that no, we wouldn't. And it was by a very small number. And there are these huge escalators around the arena, huge. Everybody is upstairs. And they start piling out pretty somberly. 
they start piling out onto the escalators. And they're, hu- they're tall. They're taller than the ceiling. And we're going down, down the escalator, not knowing how anybody voted, all seeing each other. But they're all coming out to the same spot down here. And we hear this music. And we hear this refrain saying, I am a child of God. You are a child of God. We get closer, and I can see who it is. It's Mark Miller and one of his guitar players right beside him. And he's still got that beatific smile on his face. And then he says, I believe even when. And the song continues. Mark Miller was giving all of us coming down those escalators, no matter who we were, a second chance. So finally, God's love is about all these little tiny seeds that get spread called spreading the good news. Here, there, everywhere. And we've talked about it all 10 months of this pandemic. Matt's talked about it a lot. He talked about the giving jar a couple of weeks ago and the young man who at three learned to have a giving jar by his bed and took it to college and helped. But we've seen that over and over with the yard birds and their unmatched work ethic, guiding people to pick up food or blood drive, decorating with Christmas lights, trimming all the shrubs, putting up the signs. We've seen it with Bill Downs and Eddie Moore when they make sure that our military overseas would get what they needed plus some treats and possibly for Christmas, which they did. We've seen it with our Sunday school classes and individual families who said, we want this family over here to have the kind of Christmas that they had because of them without even knowing it. We've seen it when Bob Bonts and Jim Merle spend countless hours on a daily basis honing to perfection the frames that are holding and expanding our columbarium. Perfect. A gift. We've seen it when someone we all know and love in the congregation suddenly gets diagnosed with a traumatic disease, a life and death struggle. And somebody else in our congregation knows that she's a Rangers fan. And she can't really eat or drink too much. But she goes to the door to receive her first of many packages from friends. And she opens it. And she finds there a Rangers sippy cup and Ranger socks. That's love being shared. Little seeds around And finally, I want you to take a look at our last six-foot table talk that we had this last year, because Santa came and talked to lots of children and asked lots of questions. And one of the questions he asked was, what do you want for Christmas? But then the question he asked at the last of the segment was, what do you want other children to have for Christmas? Take a look at that. Okay, one more question here. If you uh, could give the world just one gift, the whole world, if you give the whole world one gift, what would it be? If you could give one gift, one gift to the world, what would it be? Um, love. Love, that's a very good one. Um, hope. Hope, that follows love. Uh-huh. You have one? Kindness and joy. Kindness and joy. So all of those are very, very, very good. Very, very good. I would give the whole world baby Jesus. Epiphany. Epiphany is the beginning of a long and beautiful story. It's the story of God's love, the way God uses power is to come dwell among us and love through each one of us. Thanks be to God for the power of love. Amen.
As we begin this new year, we are looking forward to the many um, innovative and creative ways that we can continue reaching our community and our church members. Um, we have done just that these last 10 months and are looking forward to more of that. The reason that we are able to accomplish uh, the reaching and giving that we can uh, from our church to our community is because of the generosity of you, our church family. Um, and so we just invite you again today uh, to, to make sure that you are that you are giving regularly to make sure that this community gets to see the light of Christ. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. As the new year is born, we remember and regret. Forgive us, Holy One, when we keep you at a distance, when we defy your bidding, when we make it harder for people to know you. Forgive us, Holy One, when we deny our weakness, when we wallow in our weakness, when we take advantage of the weakness of others. Forgive us, Holy One, when we refuse your counsel, when we waste your gifts, when we withhold your compassion from others. As the new year is born, we labor to look forward our hearts fill with hope, for you are making all things new, even us. Amen. Hear this good news. Christ has died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. You sent a star to guide magi to where the Christ was born. And in your signs and witnesses in every age and through all the world, you have led your people from far places to the light. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. This is my body given for you. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks and said, drink from this, all of you, this is the cup of salvation poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. 
Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now to serve one another. Receive now this benediction is an Irish blessing. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. The rain fall gently on your land. The sun shine softly on your face. And until we meet again, may God hold each and every one of you in God's hands. Go with God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.